Good afternoon. Today is the 29th of January and I want to talk today in this vlog about British Leyland and why it was such a disaster for the British volume car industry. So what exactly was uh, British Leyland and why was it such a mess? For those of you who don't know, um, in 1952, two British car companies merged. That was um, the Austin Company, which was um, run by a chap called Leonard Lord, and um, the Nuffield Group, which included makes like MG, Wolseley, Rise, uh, Riley and, uh, and Morris. And they formed a company called British Motor Corporation. They made really famous cars like the Mini, the Morris Minor, um, the Austin 1100, um, the Austin Westminster, the MGA, the MGB. And overall, they were quite a successful company right the way through to the mid-1960s. So um, what happened was that there was a sort of rationalisation in the mid part of the 60s. Um, Jaguar had bought the Daimler in 1960. In 1966, um, British Motor Holdings was formed by a merger of Jaguar and what was then the British Motor Corporation. Um, and um, earlier on in the 60s, um, Leyland, who were a maker of principally buses and trucks, had bought the Triumph Motor Company. So um, in 1968, um, British Leyland was formed from British Motor Holdings, um, Leyland, and um, what was um, the Rover Company. So all these different marks then came together under one company. So you had Austin, Morris, Wolseley, Rover, Triumph, Wolseley, Daimler, Jaguar, Rover, and of course Triumph, and the laden trucks and buses. This didn't turn out at all well. What you essentially had was um, lots of different companies who were supposed to be the same organisation competing against each other. The Austin 1100 um, or to put it its technical name, the ADO 16, because there were six different brands of this car all sold at once, um, competed directly with the Triumph 1300, for example. Um, the Austin Allegro, that was an infamous car from the 70s and early 80s, competed directly with the Morris Marina and the Atal in the same price range and they were made by the same company. The Rover 2000 um, and 3500 and the Triumph 2000 and 2500 and 2.5 PI, they, they competed against each other in the same market segment. The planning was just dreadful. Also with having, um, you know, all these different brands basically competing in-house. You had terrible industrial relations at this time, awful build quality, um, sometimes really bad styling, and hopeless engineering compromises like the Morris Marina, which used bits dating back to 1948 for the Morris Minor, um, used a Triumph gearbox with an engine that was out of an early 50s Austin. It was just so awful. Some cars, um, like the MGB, which was a very successful car in the 60s, um, were totally ruined in the, in the 1970s, and they just kept selling it, even, even if they made it worse. And it was just absolutely awful. So I do have experience of having owned a British Leyland era car. I owned a 1980 Triumph Dolomite in um, 2005 and 2006, and it was very, very unreliable. It was awful. It was very beautiful, it was very nice to sit in, had lots of real wood, very comfy velour seats and shag bar carpets, but it was an absolute reliability disaster. Um, it was not a triumph, 
in any sense of the word of the name on the bonnet. Things had got so bad by 1975 that the um, Labour government nationalised British Leyland. Um, they'd lost millions and millions of pounds and um, they basically had to trim things down. They introduced a cost cutter called Sir Michael Edwards um, who came in and, and killed off lots of the cars. You can't really have nine different marks competing with whichever the same company. It was just terribly, terribly, you know, badly managed. And um, by 1986, um, Triumph was dead, Morris was dead, um, Austin was about to die, Wolsey had gone, Riley had gone, and what sort of remained um, was um, Land Rover, which was very profitable still um, at the time. Jaguar was sold off. And um, 1988, finally, what was then called the Austin Rover Group was renamed the Rover Group. Austin was discontinued in 88 and um, it was sold to British Aerospace. And they had a partnership with Honda by then, which had started in the early 80s with a triumph of claim. And um, that was very successful in then creating um, one of the best cars ever made by Rover, which I used to own actually, the Rover R8, or otherwise known as the 200 and 400, which launched in 1989. So I hope you enjoyed that brief look at one of the darkest days of um, uh, British motoring history. British Land is basically the reason why we don't have a British-owned volume car brand anymore. I'm sitting in my wife's MG3 here. Um, it is a British brand. This car was partially assembled in Birmingham, but the mark is now Chinese owned. And the same goes with um, Land Rover and Jaguar. They do still make cars in the West Midlands, but that company is now owned by um, an Indian company called Tata. And this, I could go on um, for those you know, brands which you consider British with one or two very small exceptions. So um, if you'd like me to source a vehicle for you, I'm very happy to do that. It honestly doesn't have to be any of the brands I've just mentioned. And for most people, we would probably hope that it wasn't. Um, but don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to um, like this video. My website is www.lloydvehicleconsulting.co.uk and my Facebook page is facebook.com forward slash Lloyd Vehicle Consulting. Thank you ever so much for watching.